entrepreneurial, leadership, intellectual, this is the Cultural Connections Podcast. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Brian Ives, and I am the producer and host of the Cultural Connections podcast. We apologize for the brief technical glitch that you just experienced with the Cultural Connections podcast on our live stream, if you're watching live. If you're watching on a recorded, the recorded episode, not to worry, you did not see a live glitch. Um, But my name again is Brian Ives, and I am the producer and host of the Cultural Connections podcast. And we are recording this episode live on Monday, November 21st, 2022. And we are recording this episode live stream to Facebook. So therefore, if you have a question for our guests during the duration of our live broadcast today, please feel free to comment below with your uh, question and we will do our best to answer them for you live on the broadcast. If you're watching even on a recorded broadcast, we'll still do our best to get your questions answered by sending them directly to our guests and getting those questions answered for you directly. So without further ado, today's topic is an entrepreneurial success story. And on the podcast before, we've had guests that have talked about their entrepreneurial success stories. And this episode is no different from that. And we're joined today by Bob Jacobs, CEO and found, uh, CEO of a company called Health and Wellness. Uh, Health and Wellness, I'll let you describe your company and tell us a little bit more about your background and how this company came to be. Welcome to the podcast. Ah, thank you, Brian. Yeah, uh, I apologize for the confusion. There's two companies. Uh, Bay State Benefit Services is uh, an employee benefits insurance agency that I started uh, going on 30 years ago, uh, 1993. I sold employee benefits and ended up hiring a few people and we built an agency. Through Bay State Benefits and dealing with employees, uh, corporate wellness was always a discussion. How do we help people become healthier? Uh, be it weight loss or mindfulness or exercising more. And as a result of that, we had some ideas. We pulled some people together and formed a separate company from this insurance agency named Mind First Health and Fitness, which is an app and a program. And we've just recently launched it. So those are the two companies that we have. That's great. Can you tell us, our, our viewers, a little bit more about Mind First Health and Wellness what, what, and what the company, the more about it, why, what the company, what this, what your mission is and um, and what exactly you, you do for the, what this company does. Okay. From, um, I know that, you, you know, you, you had shared with me that you wanted to hear an entrepreneurial story and how sure. it started and how I got here. So instead of just jumping right into my little story on what we do, um, I came into the insurance business 30 years ago, really kind of through the side door. Um, I was working for a life insurance company and employee benefits was a subject people enjoyed talking about. They wanted to save money on health insurance. So I gravitated towards that and it was really just one foot in front of the other. We built this little agency where there's five or six employees administering business. We have a half dozen salespeople. And as that, as time went on, especially around the year 2000, insurance companies started to say, wait a minute, we're living in an unhealthy population. Uh, Mental health is an issue, obesity is an issue. And when you have an unhealthy population, insurance claims go up. So costs are higher. And so they started to deal with wellness and helping people exercise and eat healthier. And here's what I found. I found that people would start to exercise when you put a challenge out and after the challenge, they quit. And people would join a biggest loser contest and they'd lose some weight. But the statistical numbers, University of Michigan uh, said that 98% of people that lose 50 pounds or more gain it all back within two years. So the mental side, there was something wrong. There was something that wasn't happening. And I had years ago, in my early years, in my early 20s, got involved with um, 
one particular organization, but behavioral psychology, how does the mind form habits? You know, if you've got great exercise habits and you have a friend that doesn't, you normally don't know why you have those good habits and you were lucky to get them and your friend doesn't. But yet the numbers are the majority of people have trouble forming habits. So we built a company that's geared around snippets of education. And we have over 200 of these little items we call mind talks, the little three to five minute podcasts by clinical psychologists, mindfulness teachers, registered dietitians, exercise physiologists. And instead of just saying, here's a great meditation for you, Brian, and it's going to help you reduce stress, or here's a great exercise program, or here's all these great ideas on nutrition, we spend a lot of time talking about what are your emotional connections with those things? What are your thoughts? What are your beliefs? You know, Albert Einstein, I love his quote, that your imagination is your preview of your life's coming attractions. So what are we thinking about? And most people are thinking about the negative. So we help them retrain their brain to move forward, to have positive associations with the things that they want to do versus negative. And uh, it's sponsored through a company. And uh, we've had a lot of success as the companies. Literally, we just launched the app 90 days ago. Impressive, just nine days ago. Let's talk about that success. And how, how did you ever, did you think when you were developing this company, did you think that you were going to ha- get to be, have this, get six, be, have it be successful? What was the thought process behind this? Did you, how did you think it was going to, how did you think you were going to make this successful? And what are you doing today to, uh, to outreach to people to make it successful? So, you know, it's a great question. And as you said up front, this is, I, I'm, we'll call me an entrepreneur, right? You said this is an entrepreneurial story. So if I look at two companies that I started, the, the group insurance business, I was a salesman. And I knew that if I saw enough people, people would buy my product. So everything was geared around knowing that I'd succeed. I always had a vision that I'd be successful. Um, and then it was a numbers business. And one thing led to the next, and I'd have to see 10 people to write one case or 15 people to write one case. And there's a Greek word that I always live by. The Greek word is salgi. And it's, it's the Greek word for sales. And what it means is to serve. So I knew that if I just went out and helped people and helped them understand their employee benefits better and uh, save money and ensure their employees better. If I offered those solutions, that good things would happen to me. So I always had a philosophy of serving people, which then led to this huge void that I saw. You know, 64% of the population in our country today is overweight. Uh, 35% of them are clinically at risk for their health because of weight. Pre-COVID, 11% of our population had reported to their physician that they had issues with depression or anxiety. Today, that number is between 41 and 49% after COVID. So people's mental health as well as their physical health is problematic. So we knew we had solutions that worked and we started out by putting eight people together. And once a week, they met and talked about these solutions. And we had a great 12-month period where these eight people combined lost 344 pounds, but they changed how they thought about life. They were more positive. They were more upbeat. And if we never did another thing beyond that, we wouldn't make any money, but we did something good for people. So we never knew if we were going to be able to scale the program and take on tens and tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of members, you know, that would be the second stage. But the way that we built the company was very member centric. Kind of, I, I like the quote from Mother Teresa. They asked her, how do you think you can solve world hunger? She said, one starving person at a time. So all I want to know is that, boy, I've got something that I can really help an individual. So we built something that was very, very member centric. And then as it scales, we just move one you know, foot in front of the other. 
Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's absolutely fantastic. And I think it, show, it is evident of success at its finest. My next question then to you becomes on the lines of that with every success, there's always challenges in the workforce. What would you say are some of the biggest challenges that you have run into uh, with, with your companies? What are the biggest challenges that you have faced? Wow, what a great question. Um, you know, the one challenge is technology. You know, there's always something that you think you're doing right, then you find out there's a glitch, but you work through that. Um, when you're trying to do something unique, uh, all plans sound good on the drawing board. But then when you move forward, you say, oh, it didn't work. Oh, it sounded like it was going to work. So, you know, the biggest obstacle is success. We don't have a million members yet. We don't have 100,000 members yet. And so, you know, it's one foot in front of the other that the, the obstacle is success. How do I take my vision for this singular person and then scale it so we can have a thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand people. That would be uh, my biggest challenge. Interesting. Then, how do you overcome? I mean, what, what is the, the the way then? Like as I said, that you overcome these challenges, and how do you adapt yourself? You, you mentioned technology. How do you adapt to the technology? Because technology changes all the time, as we know, and especially now in this day and age. How do you adapt to it on an ever so quickly changing technology basis? Well, when I said technology, I wasn't talking about changing technology. I just simply meant you think it's going to do one thing and it does another and you have trouble using it. So that that becomes an issue. Uh, how do you adapt to it? You just deal with what's there. Um, and you just keep moving one foot in front of the other. The answer to how do I adapt to my changes, my, my issues of scaling the program. So we have this app that we know works wonderful with eight people and 10 people and 200 people. How do you scale it to 20, 30, 40 companies that will have 5,000 people each? The right. answer is trial and error. That's true. Yeah, that's the answer. Means. You just try one thing. And it doesn't work. And then you try another thing, and guess what happens? It doesn't work. And you keep keep modifying and finding the formula that clicks. So it's always been what I've always seen is that you know there's an old expression: winners win and losers lose. And it's kind of a, a harsh expression, Brian. I never liked it. You know, winners win, losers lose. But what that statement means is that the winner sees themselves as winning. They're going to lose more often than they win. But if they see themselves as a winner, they'll keep stumbling forward and find a way to make it work. Then the other expression, lose is lose. Mm -hmm. A person who has that negative feeling that things don't work out for me, I'm going to try my best, but they normally don't work out. That person is normally going to find a way to screw it up without even knowing it. So my feeling is that I've always had this vision that we're going to succeed. I didn't know how I was going to get there. I just knew we'd get there. So I had an unwavering belief that it would happen and then just took one step at a time and adjusted, adjusted and kept trying to get better. That's absolutely true. I couldn't agree further with that. And let me ask you, what are some of the lessons you have learned uh, throughout this whole process what, what what are some of the biggest takeaways that you have learned going through this and what and what what could you do to strive to be better you know um you know people's greatest asset is often their biggest liability so i've always my greatest asset is go 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 um, and so I've worked hard and I think I've accomplished it where I slow down. I don't move too fast. That was my big lesson over my life. I'm 65 years old now and I should have figured these lessons out by now. So that's the one that you, you act slowly, you're pragmatic. But the biggest lesson I've learned is also the lesson that mind first preaches or the term mindfulness preaches is that don't let outside circumstances dictate your happiness. 
if mine first doesn't work, I'm just as happy at what I did and what I put out for people as if it became a huge success. So the biggest lesson I've taken away is very global in nature, that just enjoy the journey, enjoy each day. And when bad things happen, cherish them. Say, wow, this is something for me to learn from. I love what Norman Vincent Peale said. It was 1130 in the morning and he hadn't had any problems yet. And he said, Lord, what's the matter? Don't you love me anymore? You haven't given me a new challenge to try to uh, better myself for today. So I believe there's always challenges and just you know, treat everything as a learning experience and enjoy it. Absolutely. No, that's very true. And before we go any further, I just want to remind all of our viewers watching at home that we are recording this episode. You're watching the Cultural Connections podcast or listening to the Cultural Connections podcast. And we are live on Monday, November 21st, 2022. And we're discussing a successful entrepreneurial story. And we're joined by Bob Jacobs, who is telling his story about running two separate, co two different companies and how he's brought to, and how his, to, what he has done to become successful. So moving straight along here, my next question then to you is, if you were to give advice then to a young entrepreneur, or so young entrepreneurial people that are just starting out with a company, what would be the biggest advice you would give them? Well, the most important um, step to being successful is staying in business, right? If, if you go out of business, it, it doesn't help, right? You're gone. So that is true. just you know, have a setup, have a, have a plan that you can weather the storm. You can continue moving forward. Um, and know that everything is not supposed to go right. And see if you can learn to cherish the bumps. When things go wrong, great, this is a learning experience for me. Great, what can we get out of this? Because if nine out of 10 things go wrong, and if you let those bother you, you're going to be a miserable person. But if you take those nine out of 10 things and say, these are great, I'm going to learn from them, and I'm going to get better. Then when you have the one out of 10 things that are good that happen and you stop moving forward, you, you know, you feel great about, about everything. No, absolutely. I think that's very true. Then if, if, if besides giving, obviously, this advice and you feeling great, I mean, great at the end by figuring out what it is that needs to be successful, what what would you say define success in your own words? What would you say the word success means to you? So this is from um, Paul J. Myers, Success Institute of America. He was a big, big company in the 50s and 60s. And he said, I liked his definition of success. Success is the progressive realization of any predetermined worthwhile goal. So it's not the money that you make or the business that you build or the family that you've built that's, that's happy. It's Success is the progressive realization of any predetermined worthwhile goal. So the second I have a goal in mind and I have a vision of where I want to be and I start moving towards it, I'm a full success. I, I like that. That is a good definition. Uh, then what would you say as we move forward along here, what, where do you see in the future as, you're, as you continue to grow your company? Where do you see it? 10, 15 years down the road, let's say, and how do you, how do you think you'll get there? Well, we're in, a, in an industry that is screaming for a leader. In the corporate wellness field, there's nobody that's put anything together when you ask a, 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 an HR director or a wellness director in a company what product they love and it's captivated their employees. They don't have one. So we think we've developed something that it's timely. Meditation, mindfulness is on the cover of every magazine. Cognitive behavioral science is how the mind works. And it's starting to be understood that you really want to know how your mind works. So those two items, then dovetailing them, segueing into nutrition and fitness is just the smart way to go. So with or without my company, without Mind First, that's where wellness is going and we think in the short term we have a chance of being the dominant company in our industry which if that happens um 
you know, we'll have over a million members. We look to distribute through employee benefit brokers, which all companies, all U.S. corporations have brokers that bring them their employee benefits, which wellness falls in. So we think we can be the dominant company in the next 12 to 18 months. And if we're not, I'll take my Social Security, I'll take my retirement funds and go my merry way. We think we do have an opportunity to do something very, very big in the short term. Well, that's great. And that, and before we go any further, again, I just want to remind all of our viewers watching and listening that we are recording this episode. We are watching, this is the Cultural Connections podcast. We are live on Monday, November 21st, 2022. And we are talking about an entrepreneurial success story. And we are joined by Bob Jacobs, who is telling us about his entrepreneurial success story. Then my next question to you is, we just talked about the the future and where you see the future of your company. Then how do you what how do you expect what what, it, what are your goals to get to the to make the, the to make the what you what you just said with happening in the future happen? What are the goals that you have in your set to achieve to get the, those future points? You know, very user experience goals, very member centric. Um, I have a CEO that's in mind first, and she's the app developer, and she's got these big plans, and you know how many large companies that we contract with and what our revenue is. All I'm concerned with is when we take on a 50 person company, that we get 30 of those people engaged and staying with our product for a month. Because the statistical numbers are that 97% of people that join any wellness initiative, a gym, a weight loss program, a meditation program, or combination thereof, 97 out of 100 of them are gone within the 30-day period. So our goal is to have about 40% or greater participation by helping people build a community within their company, a culture of wellness. So we've taken our program well beyond our app and our program, and we're helping companies develop a culture of wellness. So my goals are all very member-centric. That's great. And it's amazing listening to your story. I mean, as, as I mentioned earlier on the podcast, we've had the opportunity to inter interview and talk with other entrepreneurs about their success story here on this podcast. And it's always amazing to me the difference in stories here that we see that you see with from entrepreneur to entrepreneur and how they how yeah. they've gotten to where they are today. With that said, it's hard to believe that we're already reaching the fact that we're out of time for the today on today's podcast. Hard to believe it's I me. Mean, I say every time I do this, the podcast goes by that. It's like you snap your fingers and we're already out of time. I want to thank again, uh, Bob Jacobs for joining me today on the podcast and talking about a very enlightening success story here. And we'll, if you have questions that were not that you would like answered during that were that did not get answered during today's podcast that you would still like answered, please feel free to reach out to me directly, and we'll get those questions for you answered through our uh, through our guests and make sure we get them sent back to you the answers. Uh, again, if you have questions, comments, or again that you would like your questions answered that you did not get answered today, please email me at Brian Ives, I V E S at gmail.com. That's B R I A N I V E S at gmail.com. And again, if you have questions, if you have suggestions for future episodes of the podcast, please feel free to get in touch with me. We always are open to the idea of future episodes of the podcast. And for now, I want to thank you all for watching. I wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving, and we'll see you next time on the Cultural Connections Podcast. I'm Brian Ives, and I'm the producer and host of the Cultural Connections Podcast. Thanks for watching. Thank you again for watching this episode of the Cultural Connections Podcast. For more information on today's episode, be sure to check out our social media pages on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can also watch this episode again in its entirety on our YouTube channel. This podcast is also available on listening platforms Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Breaker, Radio Public, and New TV. Thanks again for watching this episode of the Cultural Connections Podcast.